Hello guys, got a video here for you today on turning up a 2.2 barrel for an Enschutz 9015. We're doing this for a friend of mine, he's quite into his 25 metre bench rest and he wants to try out a 2.2 barrel for that discipline. We're not quite sure how the barrel will work out for him, but I said I'd give it a go for him. The first thing that you're seeing here is a standard 9015 barrel chucked up in the lathe and what we're doing is matching the compound slide with the angle present on the breech end of the barrel. We're doing this now as we will be machining the breech end all in one setup. So we need to get this set up before we start work on the barrel itself. And for anyone interested, the angle seems to be roughly about 25 degrees. I say roughly because we're only going by the increments on the compound slide and I'm not quite sure how accurate they are. With that done, we can get started on the barrel itself. The first thing to do is set it up nice and concentrically. We're doing that by the use of a spider and this spider allows us to adjust the bore concentricity over two points. We're doing this because the outside of the barrel isn't perfectly concentric with the bore. So we need to adjust the position of the bore independently of the OD. Once we're happy that everything's concentric, we can start turning down the shank. Now this barrel was off a raw and the OD is 18 millimeters. The breech shank of a 9015 barrel needs to be 15 mil to get in the block. So we just need to turn three mil off the OD of the barrel. The actual shank length is roughly 73 millimeters and we're just turning down to a nominal size of 15 millimeters as we don't have the block in order to perfectly match the shank to it. Once the shank's to size, we can prepare the end for the small cone. This little cone matches the taper in the stabilizer and the very end of the cone seals on an o-ring that's present in the stabilizer housing and that o-ring just seals the transfer port area off of the rifle and we're just turning the first 6.5 millimeters down to 11.5 millimeters in order to accept this cone once that's done we can put the taper on the end now as you saw earlier we did set the angle of the compound slide to match a factory barrel and we're just mirroring that cone now and we're just measuring across the very narrow end of the cone until we get the measurement we're looking for finally test fitting that with a spare stabilizer i have laying around just making sure we can feel a good squeeze on the o-ring and that it goes in without issue once we're happy next thing we're going to do is put a small relief in the middle of the shank just for the grub screws the enschutz barrel is held in by two grub screws and if you over tighten the grub screws it can throw up a burr on the shank and make the barrel difficult to remove so what i do is just turn down a little bit of relief so that's no longer an issue the last thing we can do in this setup is just put a small lead in for the pellet now the enschutz is a little different from most rifles in that the pellet is loaded directly into the barrel and you don't have a pellet probe or anything like that so what we're doing is putting a small two degree lead in and that'll just help with the loading of the pellet the head of the pellet just fits in the barrel before it touches the rifling and as we push the pellet in the pellet is slowly led into the rifling nice and gently and then to make sure that the lead isn't putting any damage on the pellet we just push a pellet in push it roughly an inch into the rifling then push it back out again and examine the pellet it should have small witness marks from the rifling but no big gouges or anything like that this barrel is fairly tight and it does have full contact with the head of the pellet but as you can see there there's no major damage to the pellet with that done we can turn our attention to the muzzle end of the barrel what we're going to be doing on this end is putting a half inch UNF on and recrowning the barrel. Now this is a target rifle and you're probably not going to be running a moderator on it when you're doing your competitions. But it is always nice to have the option to put a mod on if you just want to test the rifle in the back garden or something like that. The other thing that we're going to be doing is recrowning it. Now I can see nothing wrong with the crown that's present on the barrel already, but as we're going to set the barrel up anyway, we might as well do it in the same operation. To set the barrel up in the lathe, I'm using a bell chuck. Now you see the bell chuck there has two sets of four bolts spaced roughly about 50 millimeters apart. These bolts are tipped with copper as to not damage the finish of the barrel, and they allow us to adjust concentricity over two points. Now what this allows us to do is guarantee that the bore of the barrel is aligned perfectly with the axis of the lathe. The OD of the barrel is rarely concentric with the bore. It's not far out by any means, but they're rarely perfect, but the bell chuck allows us to get over that. The actual setup procedure is nice and easy, although a little tedious and time consuming. So what we need to do is adjust the concentricity over two points. We do that by adjusting the two sets of bolts independently. To adjust the concentricity of the very end of the barrel, we need to adjust the set of bolts closest to the chuck. 
And on this back set of bolts, we need to be loosening the highs and tightening the lows. This is because we're using the outer set of bolts as a pivot point, so the adjustment is mirrored. Once we get the very end of the barrel running nice and concentric, we can move the DTI further into the barrel. With the DTI in this position, we now adjust the outermost bolts, so the bolts furthest away from the chuck. And for this procedure, we need to tighten the highs and loosen the lows. So it's a bit of a theft to be honest, and you can spend an awful lot of time doing this, but we just need to keep going backwards and forwards, adjusting over the two points. Eventually, the adjustments will even themselves out, and you'll need to adjust smaller and smaller increments each time you repeat the procedure. The actual measurements we're taking are of the high points of the rifling, so you'll see the needle jumping up and down, but we're only really interested in the high points. And my ideal is under 5 microns over the two readings. With it all set up though, we can start turning. The first thing to do is turn off the old crown. We're only turning about half a millimeter off the end of the barrel. Then we can turn the OD down to 12.7 millimeters. And I like to do my half inch UNFs 12 millimeters long, as that allows me to get 10 millimeters of thread and 2 millimeters of thread gutter. But with the OD turned, we can put the thread gutter in. And to do that, we're just using a grooving tool. Then we can switch over to a 45 degree chamfer tool, put a chamfer on the very end. Then we can swap back over to the cutting tool, finish the thread shoulder and the thread gutter, and then start cutting the half inch UNF. To cut the threads, we're using a single point cutter. Once we start getting close to the thread depth, we can check the threads using a half inch UNF ring gauge. Ideally, the thread gauge will screw on easily with no play between the gauge and the threads. And we manage to get pretty close to that. Next up, we can put the crown on. Now to do my crowns, what I do is I grind the relief first. So I've got a grinding tool with a cutoff wheel set up in the tool post. And the tool itself is set up on center line, but just above center height. So the grinder is cutting up and away from the bore. This is important as cutting this way doesn't push a burr into the bore. It cuts it up and away. With the relief ground, I come back with a nice, really sharp countersinking bit and just put a small countersink in the very end of the barrel. And that gives me my final form on the crown. Lastly, we can just polish everything up with a small bit of scotch brine. Right then, and here we have the finished article. So we'll have a look at both ends nice and quickly, then I'll have a talk about some of the things we usually get questioned about. So there we have the muzzle end, there we have the breech end, so the shank there, turned down section, and if we look nice and closely, we have fitted it in the block, and there is the dimple mark. So there's the end of the barrel. It is a little thinner, the wall thickness here, than the 177 obviously, which is standard for the entrance barrels, but it does seem to work quite nicely. The stabiliser seals over this and you don't get any breech blow or anything like that. We'll just show you a loading in a pellet so you can see it. Take the barrel there, push the head of the pellet in, it goes into roughly that much. Then we just push it and it's a nice gentle push to get it into the rifling. Then we'll take our rod, this is a nylon rod so it's not going to damage the rifling, and push it through. This barrel is choked, so it does have a choke on the end. And if we take a look at the pellet, the pellet is nice and clean with no damage to the skirt or the head. The barrel does make full contact with the head of the pellet, as you can see there. Hopefully that picks up quite nicely on camera. I'm not sure how well it will, but I can only try. But you see, when we're looking at the pellet, we're looking for any damage, any deformation, any tearing of the lead, and it doesn't seem to be doing any of those things. Usually, if you take a good close look at the skirt, a barrel that's damaging the pellets might pull bits off the skirt. But this one seems nice. And I'm quite happy with how the pellet looks, so hopefully the barrel will be good. Right then, the last thing we'll do is just talk about some of the things we get questioned about. If we take our pellet again, we'll take the pellet there, the head goes in, but as the skirt is a larger diameter, that won't actually start into the rifling. It's quite difficult to get it in there, and it doesn't actually fit without some force. This is good because as 
the pallet is fed in from this direction. As the pallet is loaded in, the skirt is now making full contact with the bore. And when we actually take a shot, the skirt will make a nice seal against the inside of the bore. And that will just stop any gases from escaping around the pallet. And we shouldn't get any inconsistencies regarding that. If we push this pallet out again. So we'll get it to the choke. So there's the choke. It's so that about an inch away from the end of the barrel. That's where the choke starts on this barrel. Push the pellet out. It is fairly tight, but in saying that, we need to shoot the barrel before we make any assumptions about that. Sometimes a tight choke is good, sometimes a tight choke is bad. It all depends on the barrel. For sub-12, both unchoked and choked barrels will work very well. And I don't think there's a hard and fast rule about chokes, as I've had mixed experiences with all barrels. The last thing we'll talk about is crowns. So this is the crown we put on our barrels. It's ground, then countersunk. And lots of people question that. Why do we do that? And the honest answer is I've tried pretty much every single crown you could ever imagine. We've tried 11 degree crowns, 9 degree crowns, target crowns, anything that you think of, I've tried. And in all honesty, I have not found one to be better than the other. In my experience, the absolute two keys to a good crown is number one, the pellet is able to leave the rifling nice and cleanly. If there's a burr on the end of the barrel, and as the pellet leaves it, it's catching a small amount of lead, that's going to cause you no end of trouble. So the end of the rifling needs to be as clean and as smooth as possible. The pellet needs to leave it without any issue whatsoever. What shape your actual crown or the end to the rifling is, in, is in my opinion irrelevant. Maybe not for FAC rifles, maybe not for firearms, but for sub-12 rifles, in my experience, that has been the case. If the pellet is able to leave the barrel cleanly, that is a good crown. The next key, or the second key I've found to crowns, is that the crown is concentric. If the crown is eccentric, meaning off-center, then one side will be deeper than the other. If one side is deeper than the other, one side of the pellet will leave the rifling before the other. So for a split second, you'll have a pellet that's engaged with the rifling on one side, but not on the other. And that, in my experience, can cause you some problems as well. And the last question that I'll answer is, why do we grind the crowns, then countersink them? Number one, it looks very nice. I quite like the way that the crowns look when we do them like this. And the second reason is that we used to just grind them without the countersink in. So we'd finish it at the grinding stage and not bother putting the countersink in. What this left was the rifling, a nice clean finish, although it was a little sharp. So what would I was worried about happening is that the crown would become damaged. Not quite sure how it would become damaged. I've never damaged a crown before, but I just thought putting a small countersink in moved the edge of the rifling back slightly, and that will hopefully protect it from damage or anything like that. If I'm honest, we could just leave them ground or just not grind them and put the countersink in. But I quite like the way it looks. But everyone has their favourites. This is just the way I do things. You don't have to do them like this if you don't want to. But this is the way we do them, and we get fairly good results. Unfortunately, I can't give you the results straight away. It will need to go off for testing. It's got a lot of pellet testing to do. A lot of testing in the wind and that sort of thing. So maybe in the future I'll make a little follow-up video once my friend has had a chance to test it properly. That's going to about do it for this one guys, so thanks for watching and we'll see you in the next one.